Good afternoon. I'm Rod Hicks. I'm journalist on call for the Society of Professional Journalists and welcome to the fourth in our series of webinars dealing with the distrust that the media has for the press and what we might do about it. Uh, today we're going to focus on sources, the, the people and other items that you rely on to uh, provide evidence for the stories, to back up your stories. And we have a, uh, a good panel here that was to help us discuss this. Uh, I want to first start off by telling you a little about our sponsor, which is the Trust Project. Uh, the, Pro the Trust Project is a consortium of uh, top news companies led by award-winning journalist Sally, Sally Lehrman that's developing transparency standards to help easily assess the quality and credibility of journalism. For more than two years, Trust Project researchers interviewed people in the United States and Europe to find out what's important to them when it comes to news. And what they found is that people want to know who wrote or produced the story, what expertise they have, and whether the publisher has an agenda. Lehrman invited top news leaders around the world to build a digital standard that meets people's needs that standard is known as trust indicators, which are standardized disclosures about a news organization's ethics and other standards for fairness, accuracy, and a journalist's background and the work behind a news story. To learn more about, more about the Trust Project, go to trustproject.org. Now I want you to meet the very distinguished panel that we have uh, joining us today. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Katie Townsend. She is the uh, legal director for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Uh, Katie, will you just introduce yourself briefly? Thanks so much, Rod. I'm happy to be here. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you do with the. Oh, uh, sure. Um, I hope that folks are familiar with the Reporters Committee. We're a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to provide legal resources and representation to journalists and uh, to advocate for the news gathering rights and First Amendment rights of journalists and news organizations. We have plenty of um, online free available resources, including a hotline um, that are available at our website, www.rcfp.org. Okay. We also have Laurie Montgomery, who is the Deputy National Editor at the Washington Post. Uh, Laurie, tell us a little about what you do at the Post. Hi, Rod, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm the Deputy National Editor, so that means I run what is the largest news staff at the paper. Um, we cover the White House, Congress, politics, uh, national security, healthcare, climate, um, just a whole range of subjects that are in the news right now. And um, yeah, what's going on? Sounds like everything that's in the news right now. <laughs> and we also have David McCraw, who is the Deputy Gen General Counsel at the New York Times. David? Hi. Thanks, Rod, and thanks for having me. Um, as the Deputy General Counsel at the New York Times, I'm the lead newsroom lawyer. Uh, that means that I'm involved with uh, uh, any times we're threatened with libel suits or we get sued for libel. Uh, I oversee our very, very uh, active FOIA docket. We've sued the federal government more than 75 times over the um, last eight years. Um, and I also sit at the top of uh, our international security operation. So I oversee security for our reporters who are um, abroad, covering war zones, covering other difficult places. Okay. All right, so today we're, we're talking about sources. The sources are the people who are included in news stories who um, basically provide the information to, to, to the, the evidence uh, to back up what you are reporting. And the uh, Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University has some tips for how you as journalists evaluate uh, sources. Uh, first of all, independent sources are better than those who have some self-interest. Um, 
Next, uh, multiple sources are better than a single sources. You, don't, you wanna hear multiple voices in your story and not everything coming from one perspective. Of course, sources who verify with evidence are better than those who assert. Um, that is people who can um, provide some evidence to back up what they're saying instead of just offering opinions. Authoritative or informed sources are better than uninformed sources. Again, people who know the information or are qualified to speak on the topic. And of course, named sources are better than unnamed sources. Uh, and that's one of the things, let's start off right there about named sources um, and unnamed sources, because I conducted a project in Casper, Wyoming uh, last year, a six month project. And we brought together uh, about three dozen people to talk about um, issues of media distrust, why, why they didn't like uh, the news media. And we also exposed them to journalists, including Laurie Montgomery there. And one of the things that this group, and I think that they're representative of most news consumers, is that they don't like anonymous sources. One of the problems that they have, and people in general have with anonymous sources, is that they don't know, because they don't know who the information is coming from, they don't know how reliable or credible that information is or, or whether there is a self-interest. And so uh, anonymous sources are discouraged. Also, there was a little misunderstanding about what exactly uh, that means. Uh, some people weren't clear, for example, that even though we call them uh, anonymous sources, they are not anonymous to the reporter and in most cases, um, uh, editors. Somebody, at, a couple of people in the newsroom know who they are. It's just that their names are not, not used. And so, Laura, let me talk, start with you since uh, you're the practicing journalist here. When we talk, so we hear this all the time that unnamed sources are, well, named sources are preferred, yet we do see stories uh, with you know, unnamed sources. Why is that? Can you talk about that? And, and let me know that you are muted. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Of course I can, Rod. So um, the reason you would use an anonymous source, and at the Post, we, you have to have a reason to be anonymous. I mean, we always say when we use an anonymous source why we have decided to grant them anonymity. Um, and it is a thing that you grant. It is not something that you automatically give. You, people have to ask for it, um, and we try not to offer it. But the reason that you would offer it is because there's information that you can't get any other way that is in the public interest and that we need to know. And a, a great example of that is virtually all of the reporting that we're doing inside the West Wing. I mean, there's an obvious reason why people who work for the Trump administration do not want to attach their names to the pieces of information that they're giving us. Um, and that would be fear of retribution, fear of losing their jobs. So that's a kind of obvious one. And how do you, how do you make sure that you're not letting somebody just like grind their ax and, and lead you on without knowing what they're talking about? Well, you get multiple sources. Multiple anonymous sources add up to something that you can actually use. And we try to say in all of our articles, um, you know, if you look at a lot of our stories about the Trump administration, virtually all of the information is coming from people who don't let us use their names. But we say right at the top, you know, this story is based on, on interviews with 27 current members of the Trump administration and 13 former Trump officials. And so to give you a sense that we actually do have a large body of information that makes us feel secure that the information is accurate. Well, that said though, Laurie, do you get the sense that uh, despite all of that, explaining why a person's name is not attached to the information that they provide to you, uh, that the public just rel readily accepts that and says, well, I don't know who that person is, but I'm just gonna go along with that they are credible and reliable and know what they're talking about. Well, I think that it's always better, obviously, to have named sources and we do press people to go on the record. But I also feel like, you know, particularly in this administration, um, 
where there are so many people currently at work in the administration who want to provide information that if you demonstrate that you have um, a large number of people basically telling you the same thing or you've got multiple sources confirming that this particular thing was said in this particular meeting um, that you know that I, I think that brings credibility okay uh, David let's say that uh, I'm a reporter at the New York Times and I write a story and all of my sources are named uh, but it turns out that somebody said something that's not true um, I'm still good right because I didn't say it I attribute it to this person by name and so uh, I have no responsibility is that correct uh, Rod, Rod, if that were the law, I wouldn't have much of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Know, so for better, for, for personal self-interest, that, that, uh, that, that is not the law. That's why it makes it so hard. That attribution in and of itself is, is, is not a defense. I think sometimes we get confused on that. Um, that just because somebody said it doesn't mean that we have no responsibility. To the contrary, we have responsibility for everything that goes in, even when we attribute it. Now, we may have other defenses we're going to use, lack of actual malice, opinion, whatever it might be. But attribution in and of itself is not a defense. And that's one of the reasons why Lori's point is, is so important, that if uh, uh, you're using anonymous sources, that, you've, that reporters have taken the necessary steps to try to confirm that they are accurate. They know what they're talking about. They have reason to believe what they're saying. Uh, I, I feel like we have lost a little bit in this debate. And, and I know, and I really appreciate what, what you and CPJ is doing on this trust issue. And I think we've sort of lost something with the public, which is that, um, th that they need to trust that legitimate reporters don't make sources up that legitimate sources don't use unreliable sources, that we have really need to uh, strengthen faith in the institutions, because that's what you're believing in, right? You read the Washington Post, you read the New York Times, listen to CNN, you're believing in that institution when they say that there's an anonymous source that said this. When I was out, promote, when I was out promoting my book last year, I was at a college journalism conference and an advisor of one of the papers stood up and said, you know, I. I'm a big fan of the media, but when you use an anonymous source, I don't know if it's the janitor or it's the vice president. Right. I'm here to tell you it was never the janitor. It was never the janitor. <laughs> and that's the kind of smear that we really need to work against. Maybe it wasn't the vice president, maybe it wasn't the best of sources, but this whole meme that somehow we, we would ever ask the janitor of the White House to be a source, is, unless it's about the cleanliness of the place, is, is just a, 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 an unfortunate part of the public debate now. But yeah, yeah, I, I believe that, you know, you talk to legitimate sources, but how do you convince the public? I mean, we have um, people in elected office telling us that the New York Times makes up sources, you know? So how, how do I know? I don't know who it is. And, you're, you're, you're saying, trust me, it's, it's not the janitor. But how do I know that? And yeah. what can and, I... And you really put your finger on it, and that, that we live in a culture where distrusting the institution is now a message that comes out of the highest offices. And I think there's a couple things I would say. One is journalists need to hold themselves to really high standards, no matter what's being said publicly about them. Second, you get it right day after day, week after week, month after month. I believe the Post because Lori and her colleagues get it right. <laughs> I don't read the Post six months from now and go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> they told me last six months ago something. I read it and I say it's now public and they got it right. So getting it right is still important. And I think we just need to speak up for ourselves. I think we need to, I think we need to launch, and, and I know SBJ has been in the forefront of this and, and as, as reporters committee, we need to speak up for what we do. Secrecy is not on, in and of itself a bad thing. When I go to the polls, I'm glad there's secrecy, my vote. When jurors deliberate, there's secrecy, right? When, the, when clients talk to me or to Katie, 
that's covered by the attorney client privilege. Secrecy in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's the misuse of it. And I think we just need to keep driving home that, and that's the point Lori was making, that there are times when the truth comes through people who cannot speak up because they will be subject to, to retribution. Sure. So, so Katie, um, um, let's say that uh, you're the uh, attorney for the New York Times and I come to you with a different story. Uh, this story uh, has sources that I named, several of them, but half of them I got from Twitter and the other half I got from Facebook. But, uh, you know, I saw what they said, I saw the post, I lifted it, and I made sure that I attached their names to it. So I'm good, right? There's no issue that the New York Times would have with that. Am well, I right? first, I would send you to David. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even answer your questions. But um, I, I mean, that's, you've, I think you've given me the most complicated question. So social media is dangerous. I think is is probably the the the, the shortest way of answering that. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's not a bad way for journalists to identify people who may potentially be sources to connect with people who they may want to follow up with and talk with and get additional information from. Mm -hmm. But where you may where you may run into problems, um, and we can talk a little bit about. Uh, the Nick Sandman case. We can also talk about um, the Law Liberté v. Joy Reid case, which is a case the Reporters Committee became involved in recently, um, where you have journalists who are taking information from social media um, and commenting it on or reporting on that information sort of as presented. And it can be a little counterintuitive in the sense that, um, you know, you, you might commonly think, well, they're you know, they're just reporting on what's on social media. They're just commenting on what's there. But if it turns out you don't have the whole story or about, you know, what's underlying that tweet or what's underlying that Facebook post or what's underlying that Instagram post, um, the sort of the republication rule that David's already pointed to, the, the idea that attribution itself, just repeating what someone else said, isn't really going to insulate you from a legal perspective, that kind of kicks in. So it's uh, what what I tend to think of when I think of um, some of the, when I think of social media as kind of a, um, a, a repository of potential information or, or sources for, for journalists, it's sort of a, a, a beware, tread carefully, very, very carefully. Um, you can't just repeat something that you saw on social media that you haven't fact checked, that you haven't done your due diligence on. You just mentioned the um, Sandman case. Why don't you just tell us just succinctly what that case is all about. Sure, and I think um, uh, probably most of the people who are tuning in here will recall this incident. Um, it arose uh, uh, um, from a group of students from a Covington High School uh, who were visiting the National Mall, um, who encountered um, a Native American individual who was um, I believe protesting or demonstrating at the, at the same time. There was some video of one of the students, Nick Sandman, who was wearing a Make America Great Again hat, um, uh, sort of facing this Native American gentleman. There was a piece of, um, a piece of the photo where he looked like he was, or a piece of video rather, where the student, Nick Sandman, appeared to be confronting or um, it may, maybe being disrespectful. I think you could read that video in, in, in a number of different ways or that piece of video in a number of different ways. Um, it went viral, right, in the parlance of our time. So it went viral. That video went viral, um, sort of went, tore through social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, lots of people commenting on it, lots of people in the general public commenting on it, and lots of news organizations who reported on that as sort of breaking news reported on the video and, and showed the video um, and reported on what, what the video appeared to show. Um, shortly thereafter, additional video came out or additional portions of the video that showed what preceded that, that seemed to, um, I think, shed some, call into question some of the, the sort of initial reaction that people had about what this young man, Nick Sandman, was doing um, and what, what may have precipitated that. Um, he sued a number of news organizations, um, including the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN, um, for 
hundreds of millions of dollars, I think, in each of the cases. I think the case against the Washington Post was for $250 million. Um, a couple of those cases have settled. The CNN settled that case for an undisclosed amount of money, as did the Washington Post. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think it kind of illustrates the, the point that I was drawing, which is um, the sort of beware of social media. Um, what you're seeing on social media may or may not be the whole story, even if it's video. Um, you know, you're talking about video or a piece of video in that in that instance. In the Joy Reid case, we were talking about a photograph of a woman who looked as though she was um, in an altercation with a young man at a city council meeting. The woman had her hand at her throat. She looked like she was screaming. Um, information came out later that suggested she was having sort of a civil discussion with the young man. But by the time that information came out, the, the photo had already gone viral. People had were discussing it widely on social media. People were commenting it. People people were commenting on it. And people were reporting on it. Um, and so, so I think the, it just the jury the jury mischaracterized the photo. Is um, she described it as she saw it, which is um, uh, she posted there. Were, she retweeted a tweet that someone else um, uh, had posted. She didn't. She was not sued over that. She was sued over two Instagram posts. One of which uh, sort of juxtaposed that photo with a famous photo. Um, uh, uh, of a woman, of a white woman protesting desegregation and yelling at, at black students desegregating a high school uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And she, that the court concluded that that was defamatory um, because she okay, wasn't, the woman yeah. wasn't in fact yelling or yeah. purportedly it came out later that she wasn't yelling. And so okay. all of this, I will, I will say, I think that's a bad decision. <laughs> um, I would think that's a very bad decision. But at the same time, I think it just illustrates the point that that folks just need to be careful um, when they're relying on social media and they shouldn't um, sort of take what they're seeing at face value and just republish, or just sort of republish that information. Just to clarify, the suit against Joy Reid um, had nothing to do with what she broadcast on her, on, on MSNBC, is that right? It was that is correct. So she was sued media. for two posts on her personal Instagram account. Okay. so. You mentioned that both the New York Times and the Washington Post um, were sued by um, um, Mr. Uh, Sandman. Um, Laurie, Laurie uh, your paper settled, right? And the New York Times, I think that case has not been um, adjudicated yet or has not come to a conclusion yet, right? So is there anything that you want to say about the case um, to, to um, amplify or clarify anything that Katie said, Lori? Well, one, one thing I would clarify, I saw some chatter uh, going on while Katie was talking that Sandman won millions of dollars. We, we don't actually know that. Um, CNN and The Post have settled the case for undisclosed sums. He sued for millions of dollars, but The Post has not admitted wrongdoing, and I don't believe CNN did either. So. I suspect that the settlement is somewhat smaller than what he has sought. Um, beyond that, I mean, you know, I, I probably shouldn't talk about the particulars of the whole thing, except that um, just to underscore what Katie said, uh, I do remember that day pretty vividly. And I remember it was a Sunday when that, um, that video became, was circulating on social media. And the initial clip was, quite short. And uh, I think what happened was that a lot of people at various news organizations saw that initial clip, wrote off of it. And to make things even worse, the, the, the older gentleman, the Indian gentleman, gave interviews and represented what had happened in a way that was not borne out when this much longer video, it was like a two hour video, recorded by the black Israelites who were also on the mall that day and also protesting and had also been engaging with the Covington Catholic kids. You know, it, the version that was um, gleaned in interviews from the, in, from the uh, Native American gentleman was not exactly what um, he said. So it was a very messy situation and um, it just underscores the dangers of trying to write off of something that you see on social media when you weren't there, you don't know what happened. And in this case, um, as I think we've discussed, Rod, uh, you, you know, it's not even clear that it should have been news. I mean, 
if it hadn't been on social media, I don't know that we would have written about it. So that's another thing to sort of remind yourself when you're doing reporting on social media, is it news or is it just news because you're seeing it on, you know, online? Yeah, that um, the Native American native, uh, his name is Nathan Phillips. Um, the, but so this case sounds, as you tell the, as you both tell the story, sounds very complicated. But here's the question that I have, and maybe uh, David, you can shed some light on this. Okay, given that we we have freedom of the press here in the United States, it's uh, in the in the U.S. Constitution. So, if if news organizations publish something uh, or broadcast something, uh, and the the fact that there was no malice, you know, there was no attempt to try to, you know, distort what really happened. You know, why, why is this kid even getting, uh, why can he bring a suit and actually get money given those, those things? David? Yeah, so um, as, as many people on the line will know is that, that the standard that a plaintiff has to meet and bring a libel case depends on whether that plaintiff is a public figure or, or a private individual. If it's a public figure, hockey player, prominent hockey player, or a president of the United States, big Hollywood star, Kanye West, I see he's jumping in here um, uh, in the chat, they're gonna have to prove actual malice. They're gonna have to prove that that story was written by a person who knew it was false or entertained serious doubts about its truthfulness. Very high standard, very tough for public figures to win. Private individuals like Nick Sandman have a lower standard to meet. They only need to show that the reporter failed to meet professional standards, acted with negligence is the way it's usually phrased. So in this case, ultimately, uh, that's what Sandman will have to show, that the story was wrong and that it was done with, with negligence. Um, one of the unfortunate things about that very protective standard that, that you and I have been talking about, Rod, whether it's actual malice or negligence, is that it's not easy to win on that early on in the suit. That usually depends on taking discovery, doing depositions, looking at the emails to prove that you are not negligent or prove that you had due regard for the truth. So um, it may well be that Salmon loses in the end. You know, the Times has a, does not settle libel cases in the United States for money. So we may find that out. We've moved to dismiss. Uh, that motion is just now being briefed. If we lose that, then we'll be in discovery and, and we'll see what, what discovery shows. Um, but, but let me, if I might, just underscore the points that Lori and Katie are making, which mm -hmm. is how, uh, uh, how alluring social media is to make you think what you're seeing is the truth. Um, I was interviewed uh, a while back by an Italian uh, journalist who said somebody had just told him when he was out meeting with American journalists, as one journalist had said, if my mother tells me it's raining, I go to the window and check it out. <laughs> and he goes, what? what's wrong with this guy and his mother? And I'm going, no, 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 that was, that's not what he meant. But that's really important in social media. Just because it looks like something doesn't make it something and, and you, you need to report it out. Okay, there's a question here that I'm going to ask. It may have been answered somewhat. The question said, and by the way, let me just say to everybody that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A uh, field. Um, the question is, uh, what would your advice be to avoid those kinds of stories, especially when it seems like credible sources got lost in this story? Um, any advice, uh, Katie? I don't know that you necessarily need to avoid it. I mean, just speaking generally, I think, I think it's not about avoidance necessarily. Um, I think it's about making sure you're doing your diligence in terms of reporting out something that looks like it might be a good story on social media. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure avoiding is, is really the right, the right way to frame it. Um, although I, and I'll say, and I'd be interested particularly in hearing Lori's thoughts on this, I think it's, it's hard. I mean, I think when you look at the Nick Sandman case, um, you know, it's a fast, we're talking about a fast moving environment. 
Um, everybody was sort of reporting on this or ta talking about this. We're talking about a viral video. Um, it's kind of everywhere. And so I think, I think newsrooms feel quite a bit of pressure um, to join the fray and to be reporting on that. And I think, so I, I would say it's more about um, not so much avoiding it, but making sure that, that you're getting it right, making sure that you're, you're asking the right questions, that you're actually making sure, as David pointed out, what you're seeing on social media is actually reflective of, of reality or actually what happened. Okay, another question. Um... How has verifying sources and building trust with a source changed since the world has gone remote? Is that a, is that a factor, Lori? Has it had any impact? Um, I think it has. I think it's particularly affected reporters who um, traffic in folks who can't attach their names to what they're saying. Um, you know, a lot of those people don't like to talk over the phone and you meet them at various places, you knock on their doors to persuade them to talk to you. Um, and, you know, nobody wants to see a stranger showing up at their on their doorstep in these days. So I think it's difficult. Um, it's also very difficult, like in campaign reporting. I mean, we're accustomed to going out and being on the campaign trail and talking to voters and, you know, doing those diner talks and hanging out on street corners and meeting voters and, and seeing what they think. And, and now you got to kind of track them down through Facebook or other means. It's just a lot harder. Okay. Um, I want to talk about something different here. Um, uh, I want to talk about public information officers. A lot of um, government agencies have, have people who filter all of the information that goes out to the press, um, often called a public information officer or something similar. Uh, what's been happening is that it's harder to talk directly to the people who are doing the work. For instance, you go to a, um, you go to a crime scene and you want to ask a police officer something and you refer it to the public information officer who is not there. And in my experience, I've talked to a, a PIO, as they're called, and they would have to say, well, hold on, let me call you back. I need to check. I don't know that right off. It just seems like it would be a lot easier and, and a lot um, better because it, re it uh, removes the possibility that uh, information would get lost in translation and I end up with uh, wrong information. So, and, and more, and, and, and lately it's, it seems that there are times when public information officers are, are trying to s put positive spin on something um, instead of just telling you outright what happened. Um, so who wants to talk about this first? Um, who, who has had the most experience with this, Laurie? Uh, well, I do have a comment to tie this to our previous subject, which is this is precisely why you need anonymous sources, because one of the main reasons people give for being anonymous is that they are not authorized to talk about the thing they're talking to you about. So the tendency to want to run everything through the PIO is forcing sources underground. Right, right. You're not in Katie. Did you, did you have a comment about this topic? Um, it's, it's actually from a legal perspective, and I won't get into all the nitty gritty um, details, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a fascinating and complicated area um, yeah. because it, it calls in, you know, it, it, it implicates um, not just sort of the, the public's right to obtain information from someone um, who may be a government employee or government official, but it implicates that government employee's right um, to speak. And it raises questions, and, and again, it's pretty complicated, but it raises some questions about what limitations the government can put on um, certain types of employees with respect to certain types of speech um, concerning the work that they do. Um, obviously, there are um, examples where you could point to, um, you know, the, the sort of most extreme examples where you have kind of someone who has access to um, 
sensitive, even classified information and their, the restrictions on their ability to share that kind of information. But even just, um, you know, especially salient now, um, people who might work for the National Institute of Health or who might be professional um, scientists who work in the public health field and what might what what restrictions can lawfully be placed on them to restrict their ability to speak. Um, so it's an it, it's a fascinating it's a very fascinating area and a complicated one, I would say, from a legal perspective, because from the, the sort of perspective of the journalists and the news organizations who may want to challenge some of those restrictions, you have to be able to demonstrate that there's someone who's willing to speak to you to provide that information, um, that you have the ability to kind of challenge that, that restriction um, uh, specifically. Um, so I think, uh, I would like to say that there's sort of an easy, I agree that, it, that it's a problem and it's bad policy and it's bad for um, journalism and it's bad for the public. Um, it's complicated to try to, I wish there was an easy sort of, you know, First Amendment violation argument we can make across the board to sort of this reflexive reaction on PI, uh, re reflexive rather um, reliance on pushing people to PIOs. But um, I wish I could say that, but I don't think there is. I'm going to assume that there was a good reason to create that position and for um, the PO and for information to go through PIOs. So if I if we start with that premise that it was a that that it was a, a good reason to do it, um, what was that good reason, David? I mean, why why? <laughs> Why, why, why do we have to go through PIOs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Raj, you, ra you raise a really good question. Good for whom? <laughs> um, I think it was probably good for the agency. I mean, the agency would, could, could sort of clamp down on, on its messaging. But why would um, they want to if these are public agencies with public information? Well, I think it's the same reason that, that the New York Times and the Washington Post have corporate communication offices and so forth, that they... Uh, they believe that they have a message that they want to get out, and uh, is let's face it, some of our employees don't necessarily see things as they actually are. Um, but all of that said, I, I think that I think reporters uh, who are good at what they do that this is this, this is really a uh, a reminder of how important beat reporting is. When, you're, when you have people doing the same story. You go into the Pentagon, you may be able to wander the halls, it's easy to get lost in there, but chances of people walking up and talking to you if you're identified as a reporter are pretty slim, at least not to say anything that's very interesting. But if they know you cover the Pentagon, if they know your byline, it's never been easier to find a reporter. Reporters are everywhere, right? Their, their email addresses are at the bottom of the story, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Facebook, they're on Instagram. You know, they're on Twitter. If you want to find them and you want to be a source, you can do that. And that's really the counterbalance to the, to the public information officers. Uh, undoubtedly, there are public inf information officers who really take seriously their role of trying to get information for reporters. But I do fear that too many of them are locked into getting the message out. Um, and as Katie's saying, the, the legal case for this is very, very difficult because generally speaking, there's not a First Amendment right to enter at even an agency building, and there's not a First Amendment right for uh, employees to speak out about the business that they're transacting for the agency. That goes to Lori's point, very important to have the right sources. I, I will add, Rod, that as somebody who's covered a whole lot of beats in my career, that um, PIOs have been some pretty good sources uh, on a number of beats. I mean, if you if you get a good PIO who's actually interested in helping you find news, that person is worth his weight in gold. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you made that point because I do believe that, um, and in my own experience as a journalist, I've had um, PIOs who were uh, helpful as well. Um, another question, would a pseudonym for a source help or, or damage the credibility? of a source. Uh, you don't really see pseudonyms, do you? I mean, I don't know. So wait a minute, we're, we're not gonna give you his name, but we're gonna make one up. I don't think that helps. Okay, point well taken. Um, I wanna go to information that comes that sort of uh, deals with um, sort of the anonymous sources. What if 
if you get information that is um, just given to you, particularly, let's say it's uh, classified information and you're given information and you see a really good, timely, helpful story, something that's helpful to the public. Well, what do you do? I mean, are you okay to take leaked classified information and broadcast it? David? If it's truly leaked, yes. I, mean, it, 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 you know, I, 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 I would always, when that comes up, I always want to know more about how the reporter got it. I don't, I'm not particularly mm -hmm. interested in knowing the source. In fact, I prefer not to, which is a somewhat controversial position. But um, I, I, I do want to know that, that the reporter is, some, is a person who has passively, if you want to use that word, received information, not actively involved in and any sort of wrongdoing to get it because maybe it just showed up in their email or a package right. arrived at the office is not that they went you go to the mailbox and there's trump's tax returns that is a beautiful beautiful thing for a reporter for a lawyer um yeah i mean it's the, the law here protects the reporter the first amendment protects the reporter as long as the reporter has not engaged in any wrongdoing to get the information more important the source may in fact have violated the law the source may have engaged in wrongdoing and even then, the, the reporter and the publisher are still protected. That's really how the First Amendment works. It's very, very powerful. Um, and so once you're over that hurdle, you get to the really hard decisions that editors like Lori have to make, which is, should you publish this? That was going to be my next question. So let's say that, all right, so you have this information. And in my example, it was classified information. Um, even if you have the right to publish it, Lori, um, is it responsible to? Well, it kind of depends on what it is. I mean, sure. we've had pieces of information that we've taken right up to deadline and we've been asked not to publish it by the Defense Department or some other government official and we've, we've agreed not to publish it. On the um, kind of circumstances which you publish uh, classified information? It kind of depends on on what it is. I mean, it's hard to say generically what sort of classified information we would publish because there's so many different kinds of classified information. Um, I mean, I think the the bottom line would be whether the public it's in the public interest, whether it's something that is um, uh, the public has an urgent need to know, and whether you can reveal that information without without some harm, without causing some harm. And that's the question that's been raised um, periodically that a piece of information should not be published because of the harm it might cause to, you know, whatever. Um, and that's the fact that you've, you have to take on a case by case basis. But you would take in consideration the harm that it might cause, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we when have those say, conversations. Oh, I got this juicy information. I don't care if it ends up leading to World War III, I'm going to publish it. Uh, no, in fact, we, you know, when you have that piece of information, we jump through a lot of hoops to make sure that we've spoken, we've given the White House an opportunity to make its case and, you know, whoever else they might want us to talk to, those conversations often go all the way up to the executive editor to make the decision. It's not left, you know, down at my level necessarily. Okay. Um Unless you want to say something on that, Kate, I was going to go to another uh, topic. Yeah, I was just going to add that that one of the things that I would just mention is that um, getting information like that, it doesn't necessarily have to be classified information. Um, but obviously, when you get documents like that, you want to go through the reporting process. You want to report out those documents. You want to verify that they're they're accurate. And embedded in that process can be real risks to your source. So I think thinking about source protection. Um, when you're dealing with documents that were provided to you by a source who um, may or may not, who may not have been authorized to provide those documents, it, classified information or not, um, can have some ramifications for the source, uh, depending on how you go about doing it. So I would use the example of um, the of reality winner, actually, um, who provided documents to journalists, those journalists, in an attempt to verify those documents, showed those documents um, to uh, government sources, who were then, based on those documents, I, 
There may have been other ways that she could have been identified, but purportedly one of the ways that she was identified was based on um, markings on those documents that were then shown. So it's some things that you need to think about, and I think particularly are, um, are particularly salient now at a time when um, you know, you're, you're use, you may be receiving documents using systems like SecureDrop, for example, where you certainly have to determine whether or not those documents are what they purport to be. Um, you may want to be a little bit careful about um, whether or not, even if you don't know who the source of those documents are, whether or not you could be unwittingly or um, unintentionally sort of revealing their identity. Okay. All right, the topic that I want to move into is um, um, Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, sometimes uh, government agencies, if you want public documents, you have to uh, file what we call a FOIA, F-I-O-A, Freedom of Information Act is what it stands for. Can you explain that, uh, David, why, um, why do you have to go through um, this type of a process to get public documents? Shouldn't you just be able to go to you know, wherever they're kept and say, I want a copy of this record. And a lot of times you can do that. A lot of times that's, most times that's a better alternative if you know what you're looking for. Um, when I think of FOIA, I think of it as one reporting tool. Interviews are a tool. Mm -hmm. Public research is a tool. Sources are a tool. This is one more. Um, and FOIA is most useful, I think, when for instance, you're, you don't know what documents are available. You, you can't just go to the PIO and say, hey, I would like to have such and such a document or I'd like such and such an email chain. So it's, it's, a, it's a good tool at times for getting at things that you may not know exist or you suspect to exist but don't know how to uh, ask for them or, or what they might look like. It's also a really good tool for databases we're finding. Uh, we recently sued the CDC uh, and uh, we're able Stems to get a very disease control and prevention. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we were able to get uh, really, really good data, county level data on where Corona, where, where COVID was happening. Um, and our data whiz kids in the newsroom were able to analyze that data. We ended up writing a story about the incredible racial disparity within who's getting infected. You, you can't, you could tell that story anecdotally and it'd be okay but you tell that story with data plus anecdotes, it's really powerful. And I FOIA can be really useful in those cases. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. Can, can um, Laurie, just keep in mind, we're talking to um, students primarily who are about to graduate or maybe some already have. So I just wanna have a, you know, just not too deep, but a slightly different, deeper uh, discussion about FOIA, just so they understand you know, how what what that really is. Um, for example, there are records that if you get, you can find really powerful stories uh, like the one that David just described. Can you just help the students understand really what we're talking about when we're saying for you, just maybe through any examples that you have from, from the post of um, what uh, getting records, particularly databases, can what kind of journalism that can lead to? Uh, sure. Um, so we have, we recently hired somebody who uh, tries to corral, he's like the, the FOIA guru for the entire newsroom. And his advice to, he's great, by the way, he knows every agency in the, in the federal government and how to, uh, how to approach them. I mean, and I think his advice would be, um, Sorry, a helicopter's going over. His advice would be don't FOIA as a first resort. See if you can get the information some other way because it does take a really long time to get kind of some of this stuff. Um, secondarily, you know, there are a lot of places that like police departments, for example, that just make you FOIA for everything. You want, you want an incident report, you want, you want to get our report on the latest police shooting, you've got a FOIA for it or FOIA for a criminal file. Um, on databases, I'm trying to think, you know, we've been trying to get, uh, the stuff we've been trying to get most recently hasn't really been available, which is a lot of the COVID stuff, because um, it's not really being kept in a way that we've been able to access it. But, you know, uh, 
I don't know, I'm coming up short a little bit on the database front, Rod. Okay, but um, there is a process, right, for uh, requesting this, these public record, records. Um, you have to fill out a FOIA request, right? Correct. You fill out a FOIA request and it's different depending on whether it's for a federal agency or whether it's, you know, various states have different kinds of FOIA laws. Uh, you'll often see a lot of stories done in Florida because they have such great FOIA laws and you can get a lot of things and you can get it quickly. Um, and other states are much more difficult and will drag their feet and many federal agencies also take a very long time, especially now. So, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can ask for. I mean, one of the things that we often ask for is um, communications between various offices, you know, like communications between the White House and, oh, I don't know, the Postmaster General would be really interesting to get right now. Um, so, you know, data, um, emails, uh, uh, case files, anything they won't give you, you can seek. And these are all public documents, which means that the public has a right to see them, right? And I know, uh, uh, Katie, you guys have um, some resources for people who might want to uh, fill out a FOIA request to get some information from a government agency, right? Yes, I will put in a plug for all of the reporters committees <laughs> for free resources. So um, as Lori mentioned, uh, there's federal FOIA. So if you want something from a federal executive branch agency, you're going to file, file a federal FOIA request. Um, you have to kind of follow the agency's regulations and do that um, in the manner that the agency sort of wants you to do it. Um, we have a resource called the FOIA Wiki that was started by one of our um, but by kind of our lead FOIA lawyer at the Reporters Committee, Adam Marshall, um, and working with a bunch of partners, including the National Security Archive and Muckrock, um, that is a terrific resource for um, federal FOIA and has an agency page for each agency. It tells you where to submit, how to submit, um, has all sorts of information about federal exemptions. It's a really great resource. We also have our federal, our state rather, open government guides. As Lori mentioned, each state in the District of Columbia has its own sort of version of FOIA. Sometimes they go by different names. In New York, it's the uh, freedom of Information Law, FOIL in California, it's the Public Records Act, so they have different names, um, and they are different. They, they can vary significantly from, from federal FOIA, um, and so we have a guide for each one. Uh, we, have, we have sample um, requests on our website. Uh, we also have something called um, iFOIA, which is a, a system that you can use to submit FOIA requests, both state, uh, state and federal, um, track them, share them with people. There are other great resources like Muckrock, which is another mechanism to submit requests and keep track of them. Um, so there's a ton of really great free resources out there for, uh, for federal FOIA um, and for state public records law issues. And, and our hotline is a good, a good place to start as well if you're um, kind of at a loss as to how, to how to get started on on making a FOIA request. Can you just tell us what the uh, Student Press Law Center legal hotline is as well? That's a resource um, for students in particular? So yeah, so the, at the, re the Reporters Committee has its legal hotline. If you're a student journalist, you can use our legal hotline. The Student Press Law Center is also a terrific organization, a nonprofit that also provides legal resources to student journalists, both high school and um, middle school, university, all ages, student journalists, um, that, uh, that, that is also a terrific resource. So, so both of those are, are good places to go. Okay. Um, we're getting close to the end of time here. Um, there was another question here that I want to see if we had some time to, to discuss. Um, in, in our polarized times, what is credible to one side is not to another. What do you recommend, uh, what do you recommend in source selection to provide convincing sources to all? Do you run into that, 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 um, two different sides can see um, a source uh, as credible or not credible at the same time? Laura, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the stories I'm dealing with today is the Senate Intel Committee report on Russian interference in the 2016 election. And um, 
you know, the Republican and Democratic members of that very committee can't agree on what the report adds up to. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you're dealing with in society at large, I think. Um, I don't know. I, 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 the most disheartening thing I see is that um, there are people who just don't believe anything that doesn't comport with what they already believe, regardless of who says it. And trying to figure out, you know, how to marshal evidence to help them understand why, for example, um, experts believe that wearing a mask really is a good idea and it, it does help uh, is hard because there, I, you know, it just feels like there are folks that will not accept any sources on subjects that they don't believe in. We have discussed that in, uh, in some previous sessions. Um, well, we are close to, to um, um, running out of time. I wanted to see if there were any things that any of you um, were dying to say, but it did not come up organically in our discussion um, or, or any other things that you want to leave the students with as they get ready to go out into the real world of uh, journalism. Um, anything, David, that you want to uh, say to You know, story? about uh, 10 years ago, I was at an investigative journalism conference at Berkeley and uh, an editor there, uh, actually it was the editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller, talked about how so many students were discouraged by the economic conditions, but this was gonna be a golden age of, of journalism. And I thought, that is delusional. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell him that because he's my boss, but that just struck me as delusional because people were so down on the financial uh, uh, conditions in, in journalism and so forth. But I'll tell you this, the journalism that's being done now is superb. It's fantastic. The data tools people have, incredible. I, I have the pleasure of working with our video team, which, which won the Pulitzer Prize for forensic videos. They did these incredible, incredible reconstructions of how the Russians were bombing hospitals in Syria. 10 years ago, you couldn't do that story. If you did it, it was not gonna be credible. It's not gonna be believed. It's gonna be denounced. It's gonna sound anecdotal. They were able to combine cell phone video. They were able to combine recordings that citizens have made. They've been able to use uh, uh, Google Map and uh, Google World to get at that stuff. And so I, I, I don't let the bad news um, discourage you. This, this is a time when the data tools are so incredible. The ability to do great stories are so incredible. Um, and it's really more mastering your craft. It's not the craft that I went to journalism school to learn, <laughs> but it is a craft that, that, that's, that's available for you to learn. And if you do that, you could have a really rewarding career in journalism. Wait, 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 David, you have a journalism degree? I, I don't tell people that. Well, the, day <laughs> I the day I left journalism, Rod, nobody cried. Nobody <laughs> cried. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I... I you know, I agree with you, uh, David, and I just wish so much of the public would, re, re, would, um, would, would come to believe that because every year, if you look at the people who won, the, the projects that won Pulitzer Prizes, there's just so much really great journalism out there. And it's stuff that really benefits the public, you know? And, you know, you don't even have to rent a prize. There are news organizations that do really impactful uh, news stories every day, things that really do uh, have an impact on people's lives. And, you know, it's just sort of disheartening to know that people just don't, they reject it, they, they don't believe it. Um, the good news is that uh, local news organizations are, are viewed more favorably than the national and people are, are you know, more you know, they, they favor their local news and they trust it more. So that's good. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of good information out there. Uh, Katie, anything you want to say? I'll just add that I also have a journalism degree, but I don't, I also, I also don't degree. tell people about it. There's a reason I went to law school. <laughs> the, the next thing I know, Lori's going to say, yeah, and I have a law degree. <laughs> <laughs> anything else, Katie? No, I think da David wrapped it up beautifully. I think there is such a, fantastic work going, fantastic journalism being done. And I really um, uh, wish everyone um, luck in their careers as they pursue and, and give us some, some, some more of that fantastic journalism. 
And uh, there are several links that dealing with some of the information that you provided, Katie, uh, in, in our chat that I hope people take a look at. Uh, Laurie. Uh, Rod, I do not have a law degree. I, I merely have a journalism degree. Um, and I will just circle back to the beginning of this uh, seminar where you began, except the way I heard it was, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. This has been a really good discussion. and I hope that the uh, those who are watching got a lot out of it. Um, we have one more webinar to go in this series. It will be on Tuesday of next week, and it's going to tie everything together. Uh, we are going to talk about how you can rebuild trust with the public. Um, and hopefully there are people coming who will actually have answers to that. So we hope to see you next week. And again, thank everybody for um, tuning into this, this webinar. Thanks.